<laughs> so we will uh, slowly start uh, let people come in and uh, first of all i would like to invite uh, i i am uh, we, we welcome all the audience but i, I would like to invite uh, mr binoy kumar dubey who is the curator and the project coordinator of regional science center and planetarium to give a formal welcome to all our audience and the speaker please uh thank you mr anguli and namaskar friends thank you so much to be here with us uh, you know that uh, this reach this astro adda is a part of our silver jubilee celebration of regional science center and planetary in kalikat and uh, today uh, we are here with a new topic that is each solar system unique uh, to discuss about this topic we have with us our learned resource person as an astronomer dr ravinder kevanyal ji kevanyal ji namaskar uh, uh i express my sincere gratitude that you uh for this for your time and for this online session uh friends uh, i can remember that ever since the big bang uh, the universe uh, has been drifting and expanding the birth and death of stars live an aftermath of galaxies planets and uh, satellites even living organisms so and in this process of our solar system becomes an incidental product you can say of this astronomical great process and also surprisingly the arrangement of this giant spheres that we uh, understand uh, that is balanced with uh, the mass size distance composition and that's why the rocky gas and ice is coming out so we know our eight planets that are balanced in such a way in our solar system that uh, and the earth in a position that where living organisms pops up after it's so much of a bigger process and uh, we also know that mercury is the speed champion in our solar system and it is actually drifting at a speed of 57 km per second so that's why mercury uh, the god mercury with the wind book to go up now another thing is that uh, we uh, in daily come to come across with uh, exoplanets these exoplanets uh, that is uh, outside our solar system and uh, thousands have been discovered i think in the past two dec decades and all maximum from the nasa's kepler uh, telescopes space and photometric uh, um, surveys and all uh, is exoplanet you, uh, i think that uh, those exoplanets which are in a range of uh, i mean the distance uh, in a habitable zone that is i can say that uh, um, the distance from the star and the uh, earth so those exoplanet if you study then i think that we can uh, understand that maybe some world may exist i don't know maybe our banyal ji uh, focus on these things that those as exoplanet that is having the a little bit same configuration are having the ratio and having the distance from the sun uh, in the same way or in some type then uh, we can get something like some living organism i don't know so today uh, the topic is like that uh, that in this uh, um, whether any other planets are existing or any living organism is existing or the environment or any heavy uh, habitat zones are present uh, in other planets or not or we are the unique one and daily we are actually uh, inv investi investigating and coming with a new process and that's why earlier we have a nine planets then eight planets so we redefining and again we reconstruct the definition of every uh, terrestrial objects i mean the definition so today we uh, we focus on these all these topics and especially that uh, where we are i mean and how is the future of the exoplanets and the other solar system whether we exist or not so we discuss on it so i am uh, putting my words rest now i think uh, we should go forward and to our resource person uh, over to ganguli ji please move forward thank you thank you sir so now uh, i will just introduce the speaker and before uh, introducing i will just say that this astroda uh, is going on for some time this is i think the sixth of the series which we have initiated previously it was done by delhi planetarium and uh, uh, this is a joint uh, venture uh, it is a collaborative program with uh, uh, with regional science center and planetarium calicut with uh, a uh, public outreach and education committee of astronomical society of india so it is a joint program collaborative program of both these uh, 
uh, organizations or both these uh, committees, uh, committee and the organization. So uh, now I will introduce the speaker. So Ravinder Kumar Banyal is a research scientist at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore. It is one of the premier research institutes in India engaged in frontier areas of research in observational astronomy and experimental optics. Ravinder has completed his PhD in holographic data storage from IIA Bangalore in the year 2006. From 2006 to 2008, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow in Northeastern University, Boston, USA. He was also a visiting uh, scientist at University of Göttingen, uh, Germany from 2013 uh, to 2014. Currently, Ravinder is working in the area of astronomical instrument <laughs> He, he has published over 50 research papers in national and international journals. He is supervising students in institutes MTech and PhD program. Ravinder is also a member of institute's outreach committee that plans and organizes many public activities for school children and general public. Apart from teaching and carrying out research, he is also deeply passionate about science education and spreading uh, scientific awareness among public. So we have a very, uh, very good uh, speaker today, a very nice speaker, and I uh, welcome Ravinder to just uh, deliver his uh, talk, <laughs> please. Uh, thank you, Jant, and thank you, Vinay. Uh, so let me just share my screen and uh, see how it comes. Uh, is it seen, right? Yes, it's coming. And my audio is also okay, right? Oh, fine, fine, perfect. Okay, so thank you once again. And uh, I also thank, want to thank the uh, Regional Science Center, Calicut, for giving me this uh, opportunity. And I, I think it's a wonderful initiative, the Astroada. I have attended a couple of talks that um, are already being organized under this uh, umbrella. And today I am going to, in continuation of that, I'm going to talk about is solar system unique? So let me tell you why I chose this topic. So you may have um, heard of exoplanets. Exoplanets are planets around other stars. And these days hearing the news of exoplanets is common because these discoveries have become more or less like a routine. And till today there are around 4,800 confirmed discoveries of the planets around other stars. And these uh, confirm, so th that's a big number. It's a good enough, not, not enormously big, but good enough to kind of give us some idea about what kind of planets exist in our Milky Way. We can ask very important questions. This number is good enough to for scientists, for people to start asking good broader questions about the nature of the exoplanets, like what kind of stars are likely to host exoplanets? What is the, uh, let us say, type of planets, most common planets that are uh, found in the universe? And what are the conditions which favor the formation of planet? Uh, things of that sort. And among these, there's also another important questions because 4,800 extrasolar planets plus solar system. So naturally, there is a curiosity among people also to know, to understand, in addition to scientists, that how is our solar system compares to these worlds which are discovered outside the solar system? And that is an important question. So in order to answer that question, we need to first see how are we what is it that we are going to compare our solar system with other exoplanetary systems? So what are those parameters? What are those quantities, physical quantities? So with that, uh, so this is the outline of my talk. First, I will spend half of the talk is about the solar system and its architecture. And the second half is about the extrasolar planets and their properties. And then finally, we will conclude. Uh, now, this question, whether or not the solar system is unique, is not a new question. People have been asking this. So we can step back a little bit and see how the astronomers in the past, um, what kind of question they asked and what, what was their view, what was their uh, 
uh, speculations about the uniqueness about the solar system. So I found an interesting paper written in 1938 by a uh, famous astronomer Robert Atkin. He was the director of Lick Observatory. So in 1938, he's writing about he's is putting the same question. So for today's talk, I have taken the title from that paper, and the it's it's. Question is: Is the solar system unique? So let us see what he says. I, I will just read out paraphrase what he says. We have no observational evidence that any other system at all like it exists in the entire universe. This does not necessarily mean that it is unique. It may be so, but on the other hand, there may be millions of systems closely resembling it. The point is, we have never observed one. and cannot now see how it will ever become possible to observe one however numerous they may actually be now see this question is being asked when we did not know too much about uh, stars in details a lot of things were discovered by their stand like expansion of the universe was discovered infrared radiations were discovered there were no st space astronomy uh, then hr diagram was already in so people have figured out how at least this fact was known that sun is a star and how to measure the some of these properties so those but there was nothing known about the extra solar planets so everything is speculations here right and so that that kind of tells us that uh, people were thinking in right direction but even though we had no other evidence of a planetary system which leave alone whether it resembles solar system or not but it none was discovered at that point of time so this is then this paper goes on to speculate that in what way solar system if at all it is different what way it would be different and if at all that it turns out that if if it is different then uh, what would be the main implication of that so questions of that sort were discussed but i just flashed it so as to tell you that it's not something new it is this question has been asked in past well in past and now we are in a position to at least answer many of these questions which were not known at that time especially with the discoveries of many exoplanets one can make a fair comparison with the solar system and try to answer the question how unique we are so let us start with the architecture of solar system so this slide shows you um basically what are the objects present in our solar system so obviously sun is the dominant body in our solar system most of the mass of the solar system is um uh, is on the sun it, it's it's like if you divide the entire mass into 745 units then 74 744 units would be taken by sun and one unit would be distributed uh, among other planets as well as Uh, smaller bodies so broadly speaking uh, solar system has these we will first focus on the how the planets are distributed so there are three kinds of planets in our solar system roughly speaking uh, the inner rocky planets uh, which are mercury venus earth and mars which is shown here uh, they are rocky because their surface is solid uh, made up of rocks and so on and uh, which means you can go and stand on them you can build things on them you can vehicle can move on those and so on then further out in the middle we have jupiter and saturn jupiter and saturn are giant planet and the outer layers of the jupiter and uh, saturn are essentially made up of gas hydrogen and helium and in addition to that there could be a methane sulfur and so on then the outermost two are neptune and uranus they are so far away that um they are mostly icy everything is frozen on their surface so you can see that the inner edge of the solar system is around um uh, at mercury which is 0.39 astronomical unit away from the sun and the outer edge not of the solar system but outer edge of the planetary system is neptune which is 32 uh, astronomical unit away now mercury takes around 88 days to complete uh, one revolution around the sun whereas neptune take around more than uh, 150 years or so okay so in addition to that there are like uh, these two famous astro uh, belts asteroid belts which is basically the collection of smaller bodies 
which rotate around the uh, which revolve around the sun uh, and they are found between mars and jupiter and the outer uh, belt is called kuiper belt which is again a collection of uh, probably millions of smaller bodies which again go around the sun and of course in this slide we have also shown uh, comets and then there's also pluto which is no more considered as a full fledged planet and other objects so just keep this in mind because we would be making comparison with the exoplanetary system based on the distribution of the planets in the orbit and their respective size or masses or orbital period okay so this is another uh, so as i said solar system is a quite very complex uh, entity a very complex body and it has several uh, objects and majority of them i mean the eight are sun main then there are eight planets they are well distinguished well defined and in addition to planets there are satellites of these planets natural satellites or we call moon of these planets and there are roughly around 207 planetary moon which are being identified and in addition to that there are 119 trans neptune objects which are beyond the uh, orbit of neptune and then there are uh, asteroid moons as well 309 or so now the di this diagram is uh, kind of you can see except planets and satellite most of the things most other objects are uh, overlapping which means you cannot neatly classify everything so you can you can choose to call something as dwarf planet or minor planet or small Uh, solar system bodies and so on but the sum and substance is that our solar system is a complex uh, entity uh, and how about other exoplanetary system now solar system we can observe in great details whereas that luxury is not there to observe everything in other exoplanetary system with the present technology we will come to uh, those questions later so now coming to the orbital uh, properties mainly uh, of the planets which is rotation and revolution so you know see most of the things you know i am repeating it just to put it in the context of what we know in the exoplanets right solar system objects and what these things they you all are aware but we i just want to repeat it so that we can make sense when we make the comparison so in this case all planets move around the sun in the same direction which we chose to call as west to east and virtually in the same plane right so they are not like going uh, above or below the plane they, they are confined to single plane now except venus and uranus all planets also rotate or spin in the same direction as their direction of rotation again from west to east the third thing is the closer planets move faster whereas farther planets move slower that is a consequence of kepler's third law then giant planets which are jupiter saturn uranus and neptune they spin much more rapidly on their axis than the inner planet so somehow the rocky planets spin slower whereas the gaseous planet massive planets tend to spin faster now these planets as i said also have their natural satellites the moons and evidently the moons also seem to orbit around the Uh, in the same direction as the revolution direction of their planets okay so 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 there is a lot of uniformity in the motion of the planets as well as other bodies so everything seems to be following the same uh, sense of rotation there are few exceptions to it but those are understood in terms of the collision which eventually changes the direction of motion and so on for example uranus and venus may have had some collision in the uh, early part uh, uh, the early on and that's how their spin or rotation has kind of changed now whatever i said we can just uh, try to summarize it in these animations so here i'm showing you uh, uh, the animation of solar system all the eight planets are shown in the middle there's sun and in this animation it's not to the scale in term of size it's not to the scale and i guess it's not even to the orbital distance it's not to the scale but just to kind of reiterate the points that uh, you have all the planets going around the sun in the same plane and inner planets are going faster and third thing was the rotation the spin motion of these planets so not only the planets are going around the sun 
but they are also spinning about their axis and the direction of spin is also same east to west or counterclockwise if you choose to look it from the top and their uh, as i said their moons are also follow the same uh, direction of rotation around these planets moons are not shown in this uh, figure so there is a uniformity of the motion all objects major objects in the solar system seems to be going around the sun in the same way so what could be the reason for that and the reason is it has to do with its origin how the solar system was formed so essentially the way solar system was formed there is a nebular hypothesis meaning initially there was just a interstellar cloud uh, of gas and dust which was rotating slowly and at some point of time it started uh, condensing started the matter started falling uh, onto each other uh, basically gravitationally the things got attracted and the cloud kind of collapsed and it also collapsed into the disk so this is what uh, actually happened that we call the disk which was eventually formed was the accretion disk and within the accretion disk more and more matter in the center further collapsed and that gravitational energy got converted into the, uh, the the kinetic energy or the thermal energy and that heated up the center so this is the emergence of the protostar right the first initial part of the stars and in addition to that these bodies also uh, small particles dust particle they they stick together with each other and eventually form larger and larger bodies which became planets so this is how the planetary system was formed so the the question about their rotation and the spin motion being same can be attributed to their common origin or the original sense of direction and that's largely because uh, such a system tend to conserve the angular momentum so that's that's the consequence of conservation of angular momentum that all these planets and other object majority of them tend to rotate and spin in the same direction as uh, their main planets okay so then the question now we can ask is that is about the sun and solar system can we say something about sun whether it is a typical uh, star or a average star so remember when i i'm saying typical it essentially means something which is common very familiar very common or run out of the mill that kind of things now there are about 200 billion stars in milky way okay and we also know that stars are burning hydrogen in their core and that is the main source of their energy and most of the stars fall in a hr diagram which is i have shown uh, to the right it's a diagram which tells you the brightness of the star on one axis vertical axis okay and temperature on the x axis so all these dots that you see are essentially the brightness versus temperature so some here occupy i'm sorry there's some echo i think somebody opened their mic they unmuted their mic that is the reason i you can cut it you can cut it okay if they are done i can cut it okay so this is where if you can um, see this is this is where the sun is located and there are millions of other stars in its vicinity so all these things what you see is just one each dot is a star okay now main sequence is uh, a phase of the a phase in the life of the star where it is burning hydrogen in its core and it turn out that 90% of the stars including the sun in the universe are main sequence stars and sun also happened to be a middle aged star in our uh, in our galaxy which is galaxy is roughly around 10 billion years old whereas sun is 4.6 giga uh, years 10 giga years the age of the galaxy and 4.5 4.6 giga year is the age of the sun so there are roughly half of the stars younger than sun and half other half is older than sun so in the broader picture it appears like sun is just one of the average star okay and that seems to be uh, kind of making sense and this notion that sun is the average star is again a kind of 
are very common among scientists. Everybody says sun is a typical star. You pick up any technical papers on stars. It's it's very likely that you would encounter these kind of statements that sun is a typical star, a sun is a common star, or sun is like most familiar stars or things of that sort. Now, for example, Arthur Eddington, he was a British astronomer who kind of solved one of the biggest mystery in the uh, solar uh, in the stellar physics. That he gave this idea that the main source of energy, which was a mystery for a long time, uh, in the stars, is the nuclear reactions now that's this is what uh, addington wrote about the sun he says amid this great population the galaxy the sun is a humble unit it's a very ordinary star about midway in the scale of brilliance in mass in surface temperature in bulk the sun belongs to a very common class of stars in the community of stars the sun correspond to a respectable middle class citizen so that's what Arthur Eddington writing in 1935 in his famous book called The Nature of Physical World. Now, many people, many astronomers uh, kind of don't agree with it, that calling sun a typical star and they have their reasons and that's what we're going to see. So again, uh, instead of adding my flavor to it, I would again pick up a, another scientist who kind of take a contrarian position on the uh, uh, on the sun, whether or not it's a typical. So what he says in an uh, article which was published in 2015, while much has clearly been written about the sun's relative stellar properties, I came across no book or article in my survey that even remotely suggested that the sun might be special or extraordinary. So what he's saying is uh, everybody is just taking it for granted that sun is a typical uh, common star. This situation strikes me as being absolutely remarkable since it is patently clear that the sun is both special and far from being anything that resembles a typical star. It is indeed extraordinarily special. In spite of much historical naysaying, the sun's essential characteristics are not average or ordinary or indeed those that one might expect from a naive application of Copernican principle, sometime also called the principle of mediocrity. Now, his main objection, uh, Martin Beach's main objection is that when you are comparing star, you have to compare the stellar properties and see whether sun really stands out from the rest of its peer. And what are the stellar properties? We will see those. So it turns out that when we do that exercise, then this picture of sun being a typical star begin to blur. Okay. But before we proceed to that, let us see what is this principle of mediocrity. So many scientists, many astronomers uh, casually referring to sun as typical star is attributed to this principle of mediocrity. Now, I just want to uh, underscore that principle of mediocrity has uh, nothing to do with the principle of uh, the scientific. It's not a scientific principle. It's just a philosophical notion. Uh, it's a, However, it's an important notion because uh, it basically tells us how the philosophy of science kind of uh, get influenced with the discoveries, new discoveries of science. So it's basically the philosophy is now built or based on what science is discovering and so on. So historically, that seems to be true. For example, earlier, um, 2000 years before or around that, uh, the dominant view about the world was that Earth is at the center of the universe. And that view was propagated by Greek philosopher, Aristotle, um, Pluto, and Socrates, and others. And that, that for a long time, that historically, for a long time, we will believe that that is the case, that sun is at the center of the uh, solar system, and everything is ought to go around it, because that's how the common sense was, common sense was telling them. You see everything the heaven rotating around it, uh, earth, earth, including the sun. So this picture began to change with the Copernicus when he figured out that there are easier way to describe the motion of the uh, planets and stars uh, around the earth. But that required for sun to be at the center of the solar system. And so that was a remarkable um, uh, a remarkable idea it took some time for it to really consolidate 
Um, but nevertheless, that's also a period when uh, you had European Renaissance and further uh, scientific revolutions happening and so on. So on. New ideas were basically coming. So people were no longer adhering to what was written in scriptures or what philosophers used to say, uh, armchair philosophers used to say. Now, this idea about sun is at the center and earth is not special was further um, advocated by Italian, uh, ast uh, Italian astronomer and philosopher Gaetano Bruno. He vocally uh, said or advocated this that there are infinite universe and there are innumerable world, just like stars that we see are essentially like our sun and there are millions of Earth-like planet going around that. No, he didn't have any basis. He just extrapolated that. And eventually, of course, it turned out to be true. But remember, Bruno was persecuted for that. He was burnt on the stake for saying it. Further, we'll not go to that story, but further with the work of Kepler, Galileo, Newton, and others, uh, slowly people realized that universe follows simple physical laws. And many things, almost everything in the universe can be understood if, um, in terms of these physical laws. And indeed, with new discoveries uh, from the modern astronomy, this idea got further uh, support that Earth is not special. You have stars, um, just sun is one of the stars, and there are billions of stars in the Milky Way. The Milky Way itself is not special. Sun happened to be in remote corner of the Milky Way, so there's no big deal. And Earth is just one planet going around it. And when you look uh, at the universe at larger scale, it seems to be homogeneous and isotropic. So, so there was no reason to believe that uh, there's no reason to believe that our solar system or Earth's position or humanity as such is special in the universe, right? So that view kind of slowly changed. And yes, so Earth does not occupy any privileged position in cosmos. And that became, uh, that came to known as the Copernican principle or principle of mediocrity. Principle of mediocrity basically tells you that uh, if you have to just pick up in, in term for solar system, let's say, it, if you have to pick up one star randomly from the universe, it's most likely going to be sun-like, right? That's, that's the essence of it. But principle of mediocrity also became the basis for people to look for extraterrestrial life. Because if Earth is not special, if we humans are not special, then obviously the universe should be teeming with life. So our job is just to discover those. And that became the basis for most of the city experiments that started in 1960s and so on. Now comes the discoveries of the exoplanet in late 90s. Uh, first planet was discovered in 1995 and that itself challenged our notion about the solar system because unlike our solar system where Jupiter is four astronomical unit away from the sun, this newly discovered planet was also Jupiter sized planet, slightly bigger, but much closer to its host star, right? And that was kind of, um, uh, that, 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 that's a thing that we force people to think about how, um, how different or how um, similar our solar system could be compared to the other um, planets or planets around other stars. Now, okay, so in this slide, I have just shown you the type of stars in terms of their sizes um, that we encounter in, uh, in, in Milky Way, or probably that's true in the entire universe. So sun is somewhere in the middle here. You barely see the size here because it's so small compared to others, right? So this is a uh, UI scooty, which is almost like uh, more than 100 to 200 times bigger in size compared to the sun. Then you have Betelgeuse and Taris and so on. So how do people classify stars? So this is important to understand to put the sun in the context. So stars are divided or classified into different classes. And those divisions are made based on 
Remember, not all stars are not same, even though they look same when we see them from the Earth, but they are not same. They, uh, like the, their mass, their temperature and brightness can vary over a large range. So I have given here in the bottom left that stellar mass range from 0.1 to 100 uh, times the mass of the sun. Their radii can be as small as 100th of the sun and as big as, as big as one uh, as big as 1000 times the radius of the sun and the temperature of the stars can also vary from 3000 degree kelvin roughly all the way to 50000 degree kelvin and the brightness of the star which we also call luminosities could be as small as one a ten thousandth of the brightness of the sun to as big as million times brighter than the sun okay so there's a huge range over which huge uh, astrophysical parameter range over which the stars uh, can be found. So just as a rule of thumb, it turns out that the massive stars are also hot and hot stars are also brighter. So all these three things, mass, temperature and brightness of the stars go hand in hand. So the most massive stars are called O-type o stars or O-class stars. Then you have B-class, uh, B, B class, which is uh, slightly smaller than the O type. And likewise, you have class A, class F, class G, class K, and class M. So these are the seven main categories. There are subcategories which are added to it, which I'm not going to talk right now, because that's not relevant. But remember that uh, in terms of your, so these O class stars, they are massive, they are very hot, 50,000 degree Kelvin, and they are also very big in terms of their size. Now, Sun here belongs to G-class uh, stars, which is shown here as yellow. So it's also called like dwarf. Okay, so let us see now, uh, what I have not told here is that even though you have these stellar parameters varying over such a large range, the stars, the distribution of the stars is not uniform within the range. Okay, so it's not, it's not like you have same number of four stars as you have M class. Uh, uh, M class stars, right? The number of these stars would be different depending on their classes or the one depending on their category. For example, O class stars are very rare. There's only going to be one star per million, okay? Whereas the M class stars are most, um, the most commonly occurring stars. So here, this pie diagram shows you the distribution of stars in terms of masses, right? Different colors correspond to different classes, what we have just seen in the previous slide. So I just want to draw your attention that the small stars whose mass is between 0 0.08 to 0 0.5 solar masses, they constitute more than 65% of all the stars. So most of the, among a collection of stars, small stars are more common. Likewise, the sun-like stars belong to this category, G-type stars, and there are only 8% of those in our Milky Way and probably even in the universe. And then, so yes, when you go to the um, hotter and hotter stars or bigger and bigger stars, the percentage of stars keep on reducing dramatically. Okay, that's about uh, mass. And about temperature, again, as I said, the class M stars are the coolest one whose temperature could vary between 2000 to 4000. So these stars are most common, almost like 76 to 77% of the stars in the universe belong to this class M, small star, cool star. Then um, here 8% of the stars are G type stars whose temperature is between 5,000 to 6,000 Kelvin. So this is a range and sun is one of those and temperature of the surface temperature of the sun is around 5,800. Likewise, you have K type, which is slightly uh, smaller than the G type, but their number is again 12%. So as the size of the stars increases, their fraction keep on becoming less and less in this distribution. So then the question is, how does star, how does sun compare with other stars? Now, as I already pointed out that stars are not distributed uniformly across mass, radius, temperature, or luminosity range. 
okay there are more low mass stars than the high mass stars for example o type stars there is only one per million okay another thing is that at least 85% of all the stars are smaller than sun okay so this puts sun like toward uh, on the side of larger stars and 8% of the stars in milky way are sun like g dwarf that we call sun is also a middle aged star in our galaxy so that is the bigger picture and this is how sun would appear if you have to take this uh, kind of count every stars and compare it now next question we can ask is is sun exceptional in the solar neighborhood solar neighborhood is just a uh, it's it's like about 10 parsec distance you can assume and just count all the stars around that in that volume and see what are the properties of their stars so that is now possible it's it's but we know all the stars that exist within the 10 parsec distance from the sun center so sun here is in the center and you now it's not like stars are going around the sun it's just a 3d view of the 10 parsec volume of the uh, sun and it's like you are trying to look at it from different angles and that's what it is shown here now see in this this is called as solar neighborhood up till 10 parsec and o type star there's none in this b type star again no no so there's no bright stars there's no giant stars in this a type stars uh, which are like white here there are four f type are eight g type are 18 k type 38 m type 249 okay so as the as you go to the smaller and smaller thing the number is increasing so all these orange dots are basically the m type stars and in addition to that there are like single system binary systems and so on right so within the solar neighborhood itself like sun is not most common right there are only 18 such stars and sun is i think 10th uh, biggest star in the solar neighborhood okay now as we saw there is no giant star of o or b type within the 10 parsec and almost half of the stars and brown dwarfs are in multiple systems right the number that are given here meaning they are uh, also they, they are in pair they are gravitationally bound pairs right so half of the stars in the universe roughly are in binary systems majority of the stars are m type in this solar neighborhood case it turned out to be 58% but if we take the entire galaxy this number is probably 66 as i have already said so compared to most common stars in the solar neighborhood sun is 10 time more massive and larger than the other or average stars in the solar neighborhood it's two time hotter and it is 10000 time brighter than the average star in the solar neighborhood so that seems to suggest that sun itself is not typical star at least in the solar neighborhood because these numbers are speaking for themselves now it is also possible to kind of do this uh, experiment thought experiment and predict the probability of picking up a star randomly from the milky way or from our uh, galaxy and predict what is the probability of picking up the sun like stars and that turn out to be very low probability that is if you do that random experiment you would pick sun like star only in once only in 10000 trials okay so that's the probability and that's a very low uh, probability and that that seems to play out like uh, making people to claim that sun may not be the typical star okay now let us shift to the exoplanet discoveries now we know we uh, exoplanet discovery this is the timeline which find uh, what is shown here is it's basically a plot there is a y axis and there is a x axis one convenient way of expressing these planets in this parameter space is to know their mass and know their orbital period and see where they can be placed in this figure so i'll play it once more so as i said this is this is the this is the timeline of the discoveries we had no planet until 
extrasolar planet until 1995 okay and uh, even there were only four for most of for most part only the four uh, planets were um, could be seen visually the uranus neptune and pluto could not be seen with naked eye they were discovered with the telescopes and eventually you know in 2006 the pluto was demoted as a planet so this this is see in last two decades this parameter space the mass and period was filled up quickly now different colors here show you the different way of detecting so these are dominated by the red dots and also the green dots so the red dots are the discoveries which are made by one kind of detection technique which we call a transit and the green one is made by another technique called radial velocity so today we will not cover these details about the transit but but we'll further look at the properties of these uh, planets so another way of putting whatever i have shown you is to show this histogram right for most part starting with 1989 there's barely anything here and then 1995 there was one and then slowly it started building up okay then there is a huge jump around 2014 and another jump around 2016 and so on so couple of things about this the total number is 4884 as of yesterday so different colors in this this is called bar chart this different colors in this again tells you different detection technique planets discovered by different detection techniques and this is again dominated by two techniques one is called radial velocity and another is transit and so more than 96% of the planets are just discovered by these two techniques now this jump that you see here around 2014 suddenly from 2013 to 2014 suddenly the number was increased by uh, many fold okay and this happened because of that's where the kepler uh, telescope which was sent to space had released its data so after making observation for 3 years continuously just they it, it many planet discoveries were uh, announced on this date and that's why so and the same thing happened in 2016 so it keeps observing and it's it, it's not the case that you find a planet and Uh, make an announcement people have to wait it has to be confirmed and so on so first announcement of a uh, collective announcement of these planets was made in 2014 another one was made in 2016 so that's again took the discovered planet number of discovered planet to almost double okay and since then it is uh, kind of num- planets that are discovered are keep on increasing now what are the properties of these planets what is most common thing that we see about them so one way to look at this is to put them in this again a plot along y axis we put the size of the planet uh, in term of earth's radius right so if you are here one correspond to the radius of the earth and four means this planet would be four times the radius of earth 10 means this planet would be 10 times the radius of the earth so along y axis we have the size of the planet and along x axis we have the orbital period now when we are making these discoveries the orbital radius and orbital uh, orbital periods are known they are they are uh, measured okay so if you put it here this is how the kind of planets that we get we have lava world which are really very hot planets then they are very close to their host star so if your star star is sitting somewhere here and these are all close by ones then we have rocky planets just like our inner solar system and further you go in the uh, orbital uh, period or distance you get ocean and icy uh, icy giant and then cold giant further now this region is not explored in the current uh, era because and planets which are far away from their stars right this is another way to show you the same uh, distribution of discovered planets and uh, again different techniques two are dominating radial velocity and transit and this here i show where do the nine planet fit in this configuration right so you can see two things immediately that 
See, remember, we also know the mass and density of these discovered planets from these detections. Two things stand out here. One, that in terms of mass and densities, the planets in solar system are not different because you have, if you take the mass, these are the, already, there are exoplanets which are in the same mass range as our inner planets. And if you take the density, their density would also match with most commonly occurring exoplanets. So in mass and density, they are common. But if you see the distance, orbital distance or orbital period, then they are not falling in the main population. So that's where our solar system seems to be somewhat different from what is commonly observed for this population of exoplanets, which is discovered in the last two decades. Right. So these two things uh, seems to uh, kind of one the orbital distance. In that sense, our solar system seems to be somewhat unique and special because they are most of them are lying outside. So another way to look at it is this. So again, this is a histogram which shows you all the planets that are discovered so far, and along y-axis it's the count, and along x-axis it is the planet radius, right? So you can see that most of the planets, there are two it's a, it's a bimodal distribution. There are two peaks in this distribution. One is around here, another one is here. Okay, and this region is the it belongs to planets which are of the size of Jupiter. Whereas in this diagram, Earth is somewhere here. Neptune is on the other side of this first peak. And in between, there is no solar system planet, right? So majority of the planets that we are finding are between the size of Earth and Neptune. So those are called super Earth, right? So our solar system, there's another uh, this is another mystery or uh, rare rarity that we do not have any planet between the size of Earth and Neptune. Remember, Neptune is uh, Jupiter is 300 times more massive than Earth. Neptune is some 20 times and so on. And in between, there's no planet. And most of the planets that we see around other stars have majority of them occurring in this. So that's another strange thing about our solar system. And this is count along y-axis and orbital period on uh, x-axis. And you see now most of the planets in the solar system, which I have shown here, Mercury, Earth, Jupiter, and Neptune, and others are in between, they are all in the outer part, right? Whereas majority of the exoplanets are having a orbital period, which is 10 to 12 days, right? So these are all compact systems. Majority of the exoplanets which are discovered are very close to their stars, right? Unlike our solar system. So that is, so two things stand out that our solar system seems to be a new count, two counts. One that it doesn't have a super earth sized planet in the solar system, at least not discovered. And second, that there is no planet inside the orbit of Mercury in case of solar system. Remember, Mercury's orbit was at 0.4 AU, whereas majority of the exoplanets that are discovered have the orbital distance 0.1 AU or so. So that makes our solar system somewhat special in that sense. Then you have this here, I have just picked up one of the discovered exoplanetary system with seven planets. So most of those seven planets, all of those, all of those seven planets are very close to its host star, okay? And they are well within the orbit of Mercury. So one has to expand this by 25 times in order to bring it to the scale of solar system, right? All these seven planets, they are, if in the solar system scale, they are just uh, very close to the sun within 0.1 AU. And interestingly, these three or four of them are also in habitable zone. Okay, so this is a very, very interesting system which whose discovery was made in 2017. And the central star is very small, is M dwarf, which red dwarf they call it. It's just one tenth of the size of the sun. And it's like uh, far fainter than the sun 
uh, in terms of its brightness. And there are three planets which are roughly in the habitable zone. So this is just to tell you that the exoplanetary system, majority of them are very compact, even the multiplanetary system. So I don't know how much time I have, if somebody can just tell me. Uh, you can continue. It's, uh... OK, great. So another parameter that we can look, because see, we have to make some objective assessment about whether exoplanets are common uh, or the solar system is resembles with the exoplanet or not. So another, um, another stellar parameter or planetary parameter we can examine is the eccentricity. So remember, the planets in solar system, they go in almost in circular orbit. Right? Their distance from the star do not change with time. They are largely circular. But that's not the norm. Remember, Kepler's law allows planets to go in elliptical orbit. So their distance can change as they orbit their parent star. Now it's possible to measure also the eccentricity of the planets, newly discovered planets. And here is the distribution of their eccentricities. So you can see that eccentricity could vary large, uh, by large amount all the way. Zero correspond to circle and 0.8 is highly elongated uh, ellipse. So in our solar system, the largest eccentricity is for the Mercury, which is 0.21. Okay, whereas for other planets is less. So the average eccentricity of solar system planet is around 0 0.04. So that will be very, very close to zero here. Whereas a good number of exoplanets exhibit large eccentricity in their orbit. So people thought, yeah, this could also be one of the things which separates the exoplanet system uh, from the solar system. But when we win these planets, because these planets are not just single planet around the star, there are also multi-planetary system. And when we win them, win the eccentricity in term of the number of planets in the system, then for example, the first bar here shows you single planetary system. So you can see whenever planets are, just the, whenever there's only one planet, uh, the eccentricity value has a large spread. So a planetary system with single planet can have its eccentricity close to zero and as high as uh, 0.9 or so, right? A two planetary system, the spread in the eccentricity is less. Three planetary system it is further less. And as you keep on going, when you go to the seven planetary system, then the eccentricity is really narrow and small, right? So that what it is telling us is that multi-planetary systems somehow get stabilized and their eccentricities uh, become close to zero. They, their orbits circularize, right? So in that sense, the solar system is not aberration, right? Because solar system eccentricity is also close to zero. So it's it's expected that if this is how planets form and how they behave, then solar system should, since it has eight planets, uh, it should follow the same trend as you see in the large population of exoplanets. Okay, now solar system has already pointed out is unique on two counts. One that there is no planet within the 0.3 a within the uh, or inside the orbit of Mercury, and there's no super Earth or mini Neptune. So only on those two counts, solar system appears different. But that said, there are also the current techniques that we have employed to detect exoplanets are not perfect. So there are like detection biases, there are selection biases. So the two most commonly used techniques or most successful techniques are radial velocity techniques and other one is the transit techniques. Now, just to give you summarize what these two things do is that their main strength is that they can detect large planet and close by planet to the stars, right? And in general, if you are using these two techniques, it's it's difficult, far difficult to detect small planet and far away planets, right? So the techniques that we are, um, that most of the planets are discovered are using these two. So, so what it tells us is that it's possible that we have been not able to detect the planets uh, at the outer orbits. So right now, 
all the planetary system appear very compact. So that could just be an artifact because we were not able to detect anything beyond, let us say, one AU from their stars, right? So, okay, so as I said, let us see the majority of the transit detections have come from a telescope called Kepler Telescope, Space Telescope, which was launched in uh, 2000. Let me just I thought it would play. Just give me a second. Okay. So this was the launch of Kepler Space Telescope in 2009 by NASA. And this telescope kind of observed a fixed part of the sky for continuously for three years. It just stared uh, continuously and kept on acquiring the data. And it had found like several, more than 3,000 planets around that small portion. So it monitored close to 100,000 stars and detected close to 3,000 planets around them. So here, uh, how does this technique work briefly? That's what is demonstrated uh, in these animations. So you have a star, which is glowing wall of gas and planet is going around it. Our telescope is not seeing the planet separately. Planet cannot be resolved. They are so far away. But once the planet passes in front of the disk of the star, then it's going to block some light. And the Kepler telescope basically measured that dip in the intensity of the star. So what you saw in the left was same thing, that once the planet went past, there was a slight reduction in intensity and that reduction was the signal that it could be a planet. Now, if there are multiple planet, then your light curve would show the signature of those. The larger planet blocks more light, the smaller planet blocks small light. So the height of these dips that you're seeing would tell us the size of the relative size of the planets with respect to the size of the star. And this is how Kepler operated, right? Now, the problem was that Kepler was designed in such a way that it, as I said, it was just staring constantly at a dark portion of the sky for continuously for three years and acquired a lot of data. Now, for three years, you can only uh, meaningfully detect a planet which, whose orbital period is one year because to uh, to, to confirm whether there is a planet or not, you need to have at least three transits happening. Otherwise, uh, you wouldn't be saying that it's a planet. It could be any other errors, right? So the completeness of the Kepler was only up till one AU. So one AU distance from the stars, meaning that whatever observation it has made, uh, it was complete only to one AU distance or one year orbital period of the thing. So there may be planets outside it, but those were not uh, planets outside the stars, but those were not, th those could not be detected because let us say if you had a Jupiter uh, around a star at the same distance as Jupiter in solar system, then you have to wait for almost 12 years to get the transit. But 12 years was not Kepler did not last that long. Then another technique is to use the ground-based uh, telescopes. You monitor the stars one by one. In transit thing, you monitor thousands of stars with one shot. In radial velocity technique, you pick up a star and get its light, analyze the light using a spectrograph. So this is uh, animation would show you. You have star and planet going around a common center of mass. And because of the tug, gravitational tug of the planet on the star, it star also moves. But as star moves, it also goes back and forth. And as a result, you see the, uh, you see the Doppler shift happening in its lines. So this is also called Doppler method or radial velocity method. Now this method also has like um, limitation, just like transit one had, and 
it could detect planets up to probably 6 AU or so because it all depends on the ground conditions, how long you can observe. So there were several planets where people started observing them decades back and they are still being monitored. The only limitation of this technique is that it's, it does things one star at a time and that way it's not very efficient way of detecting the planets, right? So you can only observe handful of stars and cannot monitor all the stars all the time, right? So that's the reason it's also possible that we were not able to detect many of them. So far, we have not detected the planets which are farther out in the orbits of the stars. So just to conclude what all, uh, whatever I have said, from all the discoveries that have come, the knowledge that we have about the exoplanets, few things stand out and those are like planets are common. Uh, in the Milky Way, the occurrence of planet around star is common thing. Okay, on an average, that's a very solid conclusion. We can't. Uh, it's the number tells that. And second important thing is the small planets are more in number, whereas large planets are less. So on an average, as I said, small planets there is one around a star, whereas Jupiter-like planets are not very common. So for every 100 stars, you will get only 10 stars hosting Jupiter-like planets. And interestingly, if you have Jupiter-like planets, then there are 40% of chances that it will also have a super Earth. Okay, so that's that has certain implications. Now, third important conclusion that we see from the these discoveries is that the super earths are the most most common super earths are the planets whose size is between 1 to 4 earth, uh, earth radius or 1 to 10 earth masses right and they are the one which dominate this exoplanet populations uh, in the milky way the next important thing was that observed exoplanetary systems are compact they are they are these most of the planets which are discovered are revolving very close to their central star, unlike solar system. In solar system, the first planet is itself is 0.4 AU, 88 days away from orbital period away from uh, sun. Uh, the mass and the density of the solar system plant, uh, planets is similar to the exoplanet. And eccentricity, as we saw, is higher for giant planet, which is not the case for solar system. Now, solar system, it mostly orbit is circular and the implication of that is that when, when a planet is going around a star in a circle, then its distance doesn't change. So it has a stable temperature throughout the orbit. And if the temperature remains stable, then it's much more likely that life would evolve uh, 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 properly than if temperature changes are larger okay and the low eccentricity uh, also means that system is dynamically more stable right so the planet wouldn't perturb the another planet if they are going in their own circle they keep minding their own business right but if they if one planet has a large uh, eccentricity then it can perturb the orbit of other planet and as a whole the system can become unstable Right? Either planet might lose uh, the gravitational bond with its central star or it may plunge into the star. So the conclusion is the solar system is unusual on certain parameters, but it's not extremely rare. And about the principle of mediocrity, um, there's no final world yet because we have seen there are like selection effects which tell us that we have not discovered everything so far. And uh, in years to come, I think this field would still continue to uh, grow and new discoveries would uh, continue to come. So we can just uh, not pass any judgment about the principle of mediocrity. And the interesting thing that is going to happen in next, I think, the is the launch of next space telescope called JWST telescope. It's going to be a uh, um, were the successor for Kepler and HST, which has served the astronomy enormously, these previous telescopes. Uh, the, this JWST would be working in infrared region and many astronomers are basically waiting for it to uh, 
kind of start operating and this launch is going to happen uh, it was set to happen on 22nd december but i don't know there may be a delay of one or two but i think that is something that is one should look out for so this is my final slide uh, and this is a, just a central message that usually i after the talk i gave is that uh, especially for the young people that we live in an age of deception and confusion there are all kind of uh, uh, lies fake news propaganda superstitions and everything so so uh, as thinking human one should make use of logic and reasoning skepticism and critical thinking those are the tools which will help us to kind of figure out what is right and wrong what is correct what is likely to happen what is more uh, realistic than uh, what is not okay so that also means that one should uh, kind of ask questions you just don't hear things but ask questions keep asking questions be skeptical about various claims that you see and that would make you a much more rational and thinking person so with that i will stop and, and we have some have questions. some questions Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was really, was really informative. Informative. A lot of new things. New things. New things. New things. Now, for a minute, for a minute, so much. I think there is a. I think there is a. I think. Uh, I think. Uh, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Arvind. Arvind. Yeah. Uh, Ravinder, it's such a beautiful talk, wonderful talk. It I came little late, so my question is yes. this: uh, that graph that you showed mm -hmm. about uh -huh. the uh, radial velocity and the uh, transit, you know, the mm -hmm. graph uh, how number of uh, exoplanets are discovered. So, Ravinder, just, Ravind, just uh, yeah, yeah, just yeah, tell yeah, me, sure. just tell me which one. Go back. Or this. Or this. Yeah, this one, this one. Okay. Okay. Now here, what we see is beautiful thing is that the red thing, the slope is so uniform. Yes. Yes. Whereas the green one is not as uniform. I mean, of course, it's a very steep hour, right? So, is there any particular reason for it? Yes. So, yes. So, I think the reason is that uh, these radial velocity discoveries are made with ground-based telescopes. One at a time, you keep following stars one by one. So over a period of time, many telescopes started doing that. But then it kept on increasing gradually. Whereas the transit detection earlier, some of them happened from the ground. But transit detections are ground-based observations are not ideal for transit detections, right? Because of the atmospheric changes and so on. So 2009, the Kepler telescope was launched and then it made those observations for um, almost for three to four years. And the first announcement of planets from the Kepler data release came in 2014. So you can see that that's why this was a big jump here. So that was the first data release that Kepler had made and the number of exoplanet discovery almost doubled. Whereas the second data in 2016 by the same, by the same definition. Definition. and again it took a big leap. So that is the reason why the transit um, discoveries are kind of showing you a big jump around 2014 and 2016. Whereas radial velocity things are slow process, one star at a time. So you just that's that's why the slope is very shallow or slow. And, and can I ask one more on this? Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, and and also for radial velocity, I suppose you can't be having the stars axis uh, in the direction of which you are looking at it, isn't it? So, I mean, you so, prefer to be in the plane in which the uh, planets are rotating. That would give you a better result. Is that right? Uh, so, uh, so that that is more that is more transits. transits. Even even. So, so you have to you have, have, to have, to have, have rotation. Rotation. Let's say, let's say. No, no. If the plane of rotation is perpendicular to our direction of sight, 
then you may not see radial up then no, you will no. see only proper motion if at all yeah yeah so, so then we don't then we don't do. and same is same is to transit, transit also yeah of course of yeah course. so yeah. the conservation so because it's not it's not planets maybe planets may be so until until like until like the orbit of the orbit of the moon is the line the line that john that john the line of sign of sign yeah uh, we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't be neither radial nor transit transit yeah It's only the direct movement that tells us about uh, uh, the plane of the plane planet. Of the planet. The plan. Orbit is, Orbit is uh, uh, perpendicular, perpendicular to the moon. Then it's easier to detect images. All other are more or less, more, or less, more, or less, more sensitive. More sensitive. More sensitive. More sensitive. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. So, anybody else with questions? Anyway, I I I'd just to keep it going. Yeah, please. I'll, yes. I'll just ask a question that you showed yeah. one sentence in one of the slides saying that it ten percent of of the stars are uh, I mean, sun-like stars, mm -hmm. and uh, Jupiter um, uh, Jupiter's mass uh, moves between three to seven. Means it is at a distance of three to seven AU. But as far as our solar system is concerned, we find that Jupiter is the most massive planet, and it is located at uh, four AU from the uh, sun. Yes. But uh, when we see the eight percent. I mean, so when we see the total distribution of uh, 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 sun-like uh, stars throughout, whichever discovered, mm -hmm. you said the total eight percent is discovered, which are sun-like stars. And if they have a planetary system, whether we found out that there is this peculiarity of having a very massive Jupiter at that particular spot, or, or, or is it uh, having some type of universality? Means is it there in other planetary system of those uh, other stars belonging within these eight eight percent stars? Eight percentage of stars, which you have said, sun-like stars, means if they have a planetary system, means what I am saying is that this formation of Jupiter at that particular uh, distance, uh, mm -hmm. whether it is uh, due to means uh, it is is it a random process or uh, some understanding is there like one giant is formed, the the transition between terrestrial and gas giant forms with a super means a very big gaseous uh, planet. Yeah. So that type of means I just wanted to clarify since right. I. Yeah. So so again, the location of Jupiter in solar system, where it's around 4.2 AU, uh, that again seems to be somewhat odd compared to what is already being discovered. Most of the Jupiters either they are hot Jupiters or within one AU or two AU. But as I said, this could be just the selection effect. We have not probably monitored all the stars up to a distance of let us say uh, four AU or. Many stars may have missed um, so far uh, in term of observations up to four AU or more, right? So it's it's still not very clear whether uh, Jupiter's location is unique or it's just that we have not had enough uh, observations to uh, observations of star to find Jupiter's at that location. So that could be. But but I think this question, how the planet formed, that's that's still a very uh, very active area of research. There are several uh, theories about it that planets can form at one location. They can migrate inward. They can migrate outward. But, but still, I think there's uh, one unified picture has not yet been emerged because you can't see the star forming in situ. Right? It's it, this process takes millions of years. So, so yeah, there's there's no final word on that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, you are muted, Arvind. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, th this James Webb Telescope is it likely to increase the number of uh, planets to be discovered, or likely to increase that, uh, uh, or rather, you get Jupiter-like planets more? Now that uh, it is just around the corner, that they might launch it. Right, right. The the J W S T. W S T. Oh, the Z. The Z. Yeah. J W S T. J W S T. 
population and study their atmosphere in much more details than it could be done from earth or from any other uh, telescope thank one you thing, so one thing one thing i would like to make uh, actually what happened is that uh, when we were discussing about the eccentricity of the uh, uh -huh. planets uh, you showed uh, the graph showing that uh, zero eccentricity circular orbits there are quite a large number Yes. Now, normally when it is taught in uh, at any level they are projected as if they are some idealistic cases and uh, actually huh. ellipticity is the main thing which will be uh, taken up but yeah. it, it was good to know that uh, so many actually exist with zero eccentricity oh, oh, no that, i think uh, in that plot there was a minor uh, i didn't explain it see the eccentricity is not measured for all the planets it's probably measured for 1000 or so because that requires only radial velocity and give you the eccentricity measurement and not the transit so uh, either you have to follow up the transit discovery and get the eccentricity or uh, do it radial velocity uh, so so many were looking close to zero that is because it's not known for those so that may that that's just a artifact i guess not not the actual uh, measure of eccentricity okay so if there are no more questions i think uh, i would like to thank uh, ravinder uh, kumar vanyal who has uh, taken uh, uh, from his busy schedule who has taken some time and uh, given us such an informative talk it was really a good talk i think myself i have enjoyed it and i am sure that all the audience who have been with us today not only in uh, our google meet also in facebook and uh, um, youtube they might have all enjoyed your talk so thank you very much uh, to have been accepting our inv invitation and given the talk here thanks thanks jent and i also enjoyed and i wish all the best for the stoada and merry christmas to all of you thank in advance <laughs> thank you thank you thank you okay